All right. So, um, good, good day, everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is John Dernbach, and I direct the Environmental Law and Sustainability Center at Widener University Commonwealth Law School. Uh, this is our Distinguished Environmental Speaker Series, uh, and it's the 12th year of our speaker series. We've made a point of inviting highly qualified speakers from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. We've also made a point of giving our speakers the opportunity to reach beyond the academy and into the broader community, which is why we do this program late in the afternoon and uh, why we're doing it on Zoom. Uh, today's speaker, as I think you all know, is Professor Irma Russell. She is the Edward A. Smith Missouri Chair in Law, Constitution and Society at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Law School. She has served as Dean earlier of the University of Montana School of Law and as Professor and Director of the National Environment, Energy, Law and Policy Institute at the University of Tulsa College of Law. She's a former chair of the American Bar Association Section of Energy, excuse me, Environment, Energy and Resources, the American Association of Law School Section of Natural Resources and Energy Law, and the American Bar Association Section on Professional Responsibility. But prior to teaching, uh, she practiced law in Kansas City, Missouri, and Tennessee. Uh, and in practice, she represented clients on a wide range, a wide range of clients and has a substance liability, environmental impact assessment, wetlands designation, site mitigation, and other environmental issues. I should say on a personal note, uh, Professor Russell and I have known each other for a long time through our work with the American Bar Association. Uh, she and I are co-authors with Matt Bogosian of a leadership guide to sustainable development and law practice, which will be published by the American Bar Association Press. Uh, the, uh, the book chapter in the materials for today is from that book. Uh, and and uh, she and Matt Bogosian and I have also co-authored an article which is in the materials uh, for today's program. Her presentation today is Lawyering as if the Future Matters. Um, on an administrative uh, note, just announcement before we begin, if you want CLE credit for this program, uh, please see the link to the evaluation form that will be put in the chat feature. Uh, you must fill out the evaluation to get credit. And for those of you in Pennsylvania, um, I'm well aware that the ethics credit, is a, which is offered here, is a very special kind of credit. So uh, please welcome Professor Russell. Thank you, John. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> and um, I have a little frog in my throat, so I will uh, try to keep the croaking to a minimum. Well, my uh, topic, as John noted, is lawyering as if the future mattered. And um, as I go through this topic, <clears throat> oh, now I have to be sure I can advance. There we go. Um, I welcome your questions. We have set aside time at the end for questions. So either feel free to jot something down or if it's something that mm, things won't make sense unless you get it answered at the time, please feel free to raise the hand that you have, the, the little uh, hand as part of our uh, Zoom uh, sideshow. So uh, <clears throat> I wanna note that this presentation is inspired by a couple of works that John has authored. One is Acting as if Tomorrow Matters, Accelerating the Transition to Sustainability. This is a wonderful book and you can find it online. Uh, the second is an article that I was so uh, happy to have as an article in a symposium that my law school put together, Lawyering as if Tomorrow Matters. Uh, and that was just a few years ago. And then I also want to note that I'm inspired by John himself as a person. And uh, at this stage in my life, uh, that inspiration is leading me to think of other things to serve uh, society and uh, protect society and the environment. So uh, as John noted, chapter three of the book that we uh, have been working on together is focused on ethics issues, lawyers' responsibilities for justice and the public good. And this um, has allowed me to take a sort of new look at 
professional responsibility and um, the uh, model rules of professional conduct and actually has led me to start teaching my class, the, the introduction of the class on uh, professional responsibility in a different way, which I will talk about a little bit. So I wanna make a couple of points at the beginning. One is that this presentation states the obvious. Now, it might make you think, well, <laughs> why am I attending this? I think that you'll see, although, the grounding that I give is obvious. It's the sort of obvious thing that we sometimes don't focus on or even simply forget about. Uh, I'm not proposing new rules here. I'm proposing that we look at <clears throat> our role in the law and some of our duties under the law and see how that might change how we conduct business as usual since the times are not usual times. So, oh my goodness, that went right to the end. I have to get on top of my slideshow. Let's see. I'm gonna go back into slideshow and just go forward from there. Sorry about that. Uh, so this question is one that we pose to ourselves when we began working on this book and on the article that John mentioned. And that is, what changes would we see in our world if all 1.3 million lawyers in our country focused on the public good and focused on what we could do to solve the climate crisis? the disruption of the climate. So this led me to think about our role as lawyers, getting back to the sort of basics, the foundation of what we do. And this um, uh, statement about lawyers comes from the uh, preamble uh, of the model rules of professional conduct. And you all know that the model rules are not applicable to you. They are just a model. Like the Uniform Commercial Code or many uniform laws, they don't have the force of law until your state uh, passes them. And states sometimes have variations from the model rules as part of their process of passing them. So it's very important to um, look at your rules of your state of licensure on all of this. Although I can tell you every state of licensure starts out with this. A lawyer as a member of the legal profession is a representative of clients, an officer of the legal system, and a public citizen for having special, having special responsibility for the quality of justice. This is sobering indeed. Uh, it tells us things we know already and really reminds us of something we might've forgotten about since law school. So yes, we know we are representatives of clients. That's our day to day. And we know that we are officers of the legal system. And in fact, <clears throat> conduct that would not be um, a violation of a rule or the law if it were an ordinary citizen, a non-lawyer, may be a violation of the rules because of this status of lawyers as officers of the legal system. That gives them a special um, status, uh, but also gives them special responsibilities. So, this the chapter and also this presentation um, has an organization of three touchstones. This is the obvious part I was telling you about. What are the duties of lawyers? I think these are the main three. From these three emanate everything else about our duties of safekeeping of client property, of uh, speaking the truth to others in representing a client, of being candid to the court, 
uh, of uh, how to sell a, a law practice. So the details really all spring from these basic points. First, the touchstone of obey and respect the law. I'll get into in just a minute, the fact that lawyers are not above the law. Serve your clients legitimate interests using lawful means, competence and diligence. And then serve the public interest, including law reform. Now, something in going over my notes this time that sort of came to the fore uh, for me is the fact that we, we have always limited what are uh, the interests of the client that a lawyer can serve. And there's more on that. So in this same touchstone, starting back at touchstone one, I have listed them all, but we're back on touchstone one. Nobody is above the law. Uh, as you know, this is, um, uh, has been a great uh, topic of conversation these days. And if you go back to the Magna Carta, even the king is not above the law. There were provisions in there for the different noble men to uh, constrain the king if he did certain things. So lawyers are not above the law. We know that. That's one of those obvious things. And clients are not above the law either. And that's true whether they are real people, humanoids, some people say, or fictional persons that we call corporations or organizations. So this is the change that I have made in my um, organization of the class I teach on professional responsibility. I begin with the restatement uh, of the law governing lawyers because it incorporates common law that affects lawyers. So I've now become convinced that starting out in the rules gives us a um, insularity and fails to focus on some of the liabilities that could exist. So I also talk, tell my students that they're regulated not just by the rules, but by tort law and contract law and we have really a dual track of, of uh, constraints or standards that lawyers always need to keep in mind. One of them is discipline by a disciplinary board. That's what most states call their um, um, body that issues um, sanctions against a lawyer who's been found to have violated one of the rules of conduct. But Another important constraint on lawyers is the law, and lawyers have been found uh, guilty of criminal violations as part of practice. Um, lawyers have uh, spent time uh, in prison for such violations at times, including some famous ones, Webb Hubble and John Mitchell uh, and others. So I think a good place to start is the statement from the restatement of the law governing lawyers that lawyers have the same liability as ordinary persons, unless there's an exception. And I'm gonna talk about the two main exceptions. And then from the um, principles of corporate governance, also from the American Law Institute, uh, the statement that a corporation is obligated to the same extent as a natural person to act within the boundaries set by law. Now, this is also, um, enforced, reinforced by statements in the preamble to the model rules. So we're still on obey and respect the law. I mentioned I would talk about some exceptions. These are narrow exceptions, but uh, it's good, I think, to remember the exceptions so the general rule seems more real. There is specific lawyer immunity uh, sometimes called the common law privilege uh, from liability for um, statements made in pursuing a lawsuit. So um, if the lawyer drafts the complaint for the client 
And some of the things might be defamation in there unless they're true. And then you lose the lawsuit. That doesn't mean now a defamation action can be brought against the lawyer uh, because of this immunity for the proper functioning of the law of tort law. If we did that, it would be such a break on um, litigation that we would worry that people would not be uh, pursuing legal channels to vindicate their rights. Also as a lawyer, uh, and this one I have to be a little careful about, I also teach contract law. If you advise your client, yes, it's really in your interests to break this contract, generally speaking, uh, you are not uh, going to be held for tortious interference with a contract right that is, in other words, your um, uh, rights and privileges as a lawyer and your client's rights and privileges to have legal advice carve out an exception in the tort of interference with contract that protects you and, and the client for most uh, purposes. So those two exceptions, I think, are ones that we sometimes never need to focus on, but they also drive home the general duty that we are not, we do not get a free card. The law applies to us. And then I also like to point out that we do have these heightened duties that other people wouldn't have. Uh, for instance, suggesting, suggesting that you can influence a tribunal. Uh, that is a violation of uh, the uh, rules of professional conduct and uh, lawyers have been sanctioned for such violation. Um, and then the important rules of, I have model rule here because we are talking about the model rules. These rules are uniform, however, uh, throughout the states. 3.3, candor to the tribunal. You must reveal things to the tribunal. That's a court generally, but it can also be an administrative law tribunal. And then truthfulness in statements to others. So that's not the real focus, but it's a good background to note that the law can be applied to us, the common law, statutory law, and even the law of um, the rules of professional conduct. So uh, the second touch, touchstone, remember, is serving your client's interest. Uh, but this is not any interest at any cost uh, by any means, of course. A uh, famous old Hickman case uh, indicates the attributes and responsibilities of lawyers. Lawyer, the lawyer is one who works for the advancement of justice while faithfully protecting the rightful interests of the client. So of course, being a lawyer doesn't give you a free card to help the, law, the client uh, engage in fraud or pursue something that would be, for instance, a, um, a trade violation, antitrust violation, or uh, any kind of restraint of trade, just for example. So serving your client's legitimate interests within the bounds of law. Those are the two constraints that sometimes get lost in the shuffle uh, when we're talking about serving the client. That is our calling. That's our first listed uh, purpose as lawyers. Uh, the model rules also indicate these points uh, in the preamble, that the rules don't supplant the law. They do not carve out uh, um, safe havens for lawyers, generally speaking. And the obligation zealously to protect and pursue a client's interests are qualified, it has to be a legitimate interest not just something the client wants, and how you pursue those interests has to be within the bounds of the law, not taking uh, advantage that the law would um, sanction you for. So not a free card. Then uh, I'm gonna step away here just to close a door. Uh, here, an important rule model 1.2, deals with the lawyer's duty as counselor. Okay. 
And this has been a rule that's been debated a lot. The debate really has been answered just recently, a year ago, um, well, a year and a half ago in this formal opinion that I'll talk a little bit about. So here's what the rule says. A lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent, but a lawyer may discuss uh, the legal consequences of any proposed course of conduct with a client and may counsel or assist a client to make a good faith effort to determine the validity, scope, meaning, or application of the law. Now, obviously, this was never meant to be a loophole where you can do anything you want and say, oh, we're making a good faith test of the law here. Uh, that's not what that's about. And it never was. But lawyers sometimes, um, or really more scholars than lawyers, made the point that I'm not here to judge my client. I'm here to do the bidding of my client. And if uh, something turns out to be fraudulent, well, I didn't know. And this standard does require knowledge of the lawyer. Now, what formal opinion 421 does is say, yes, but if you have intentional ignorance, then you are not fulfilling your duty. And this opinion came about because of various laundering screens or uh, other primarily financially um, dodgy cases that came up where it appeared to courts and to um, the ABA that lawyers were helping in some ways and just keeping um, some part of the client's operation off stage so the lawyer didn't really know or had an argument that he did not know about the conduct. So this formal opinion is uh, helpful, I think, to lawyers to say, you know, you can't uh, uh, simply close your eyes if it looks like the client is engaged in fraud. Uh, you need to follow up on it and then tell the client, I can't help you with this because I'm not, it's not appropriate for me to engage in conduct that is uh, fraudulent. Now, these uh, two restrictions show up also in the attorney-client privilege and the work pro product doctrine. And in those doctrines, the knowledge of the lawyer does not matter. So in a sense, this um, rule is giving more protection in a sense to the lawyer than attorney-client privilege or, or product doctrine do. So here's another one that was 1.2, this is 2.1. And so I think a very important uh, section that has not been uh, the subject of much interest or writing, and it's the duty to serve as advisor. And uh, this is a shall, you know, most rules are, uh, either shall or shall not. Some say should, and this is an example of that as well. Um, uh, and some are just sort of public service announcements that don't really say anything. 1.2 uh, C is sort of like that. It just says a lawyer uh, working for a client is not endorsing uh, the client. Well, we all know that and it's not really a rule. So this one, 2.1, focuses in on what we do as advisors. And of course, that is much more lawyer work than uh, what we have in litigation. So this is an important uh, aspect of lawyering. And it says the lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice. So this is a shall, you have a duty to give the client your advice even if it is, and this word is from the comment, even if it is unpalpable to the, palatable to the client, you're, you have to tell them, have to tell the client things they don't wanna know. If it's your independent judgment, say that they need to report a, um, in my world, um, a leak or a disposal of hazardous waste. So on the property, you have to report it. And believe me, in my uh, career, when I started out in 1980, 
it, it was met with uh, sort of uh, dismay and disbelief by a client sometimes. Well, you can't expect me to do this. Nobody would report this. Well, things have come a long way in environmental law since then. So the second part of this rule is the should or may. Uh, the lawyer may refer not only to the law, but to other considerations, moral, economic, social, political factors that may be relevant to the situation. So uh, I think this is the message that you need to really serve your client's larger interests. Uh, for example, in contract law, you might have a situation where there's a, a clear breach. And so the sort of gotcha lawyer might want to um, make it clear and hold that breaching party uh, to uh, the task and get damages. And that may seem like a good short-term goal, but in the client's long-term interest, that might be a trading partner uh, or um, even an employer that the client uh, might well cultivate. And so there is an example of economic interest that is larger than the law and might uh, report, uh, help the lawyer report to the client, the client's best interest, which might be not to, uh, not to sue. I'm sure we've all had that circumstance. This is a provision that also really encourages lawyers to think more broadly. Can they discern and identify and explain long-term uh, benefits that might not be apparent to the client? And those might be um, benefits that would be <clears throat> reaped by the corporation in um, uh, more sustainable conduct. And of course, corporations have a longer life than individuals. And so complying early might be in the client's best interest. So uh, part of what we talk about in the book is finding for the client non-apparent benefits of compliance. I'll give you one example. And non-apparent risks of not doing more. So uh, I did a lot of circular representation when I was um, uh, practicing. And circular had just really come into being when I started practicing. But if I had practiced earlier, and if I had known that CERCLA was going to have some pretty definite and costly requirements, it would have been in my client's best interest for me to explain that and say, early compliance, early, really um, premature, you might say compliance is a benefit to you because you go ahead and dump, you're not in violation of CERCLA yet, but it looks back in time and uh, will require a cleanup be done. Um, there's no intent requirement there. So early uh, advance requirement, uh, advance compliance with a, a requirement that doesn't even exist yet may be very beneficial uh, to the client. So that's an example of serving the client. And then three, uh, this is back to that uh, preamble, advancing justice, law reform, and the public interest. Uh, as a public citizen, a lawyer should, you remember the first sentence of the preamble of the model rules included the lawyer as a public citizen seeking to improve the quality of justice. And then the sixth sentence from the preamble or sixth paragraph gets into what that might involve. As a public citizen, a lawyer should seek improvement of the law, access to the legal system, the administration of justice, and the quality of service rendered by the legal profession. And I think one example, good example of the ABA and lawyers taking up this challenge is <clears throat> model rule 6.1, which says we should all be doing pro bono 
service. Um, in other words, it's not it's not required. And even 6.1 does not require this. It says it's a responsibility. But the comment says this is a responsibility that will not be uh, seen as a violation. So we've done a pretty good job. We all more is needed, of course, in representing individuals who cannot afford representation. And we've seen this a lot also in the social justice movements like the um, uh, Innocence Project and um, work by lawyers to uh, vindicate uh, interests. We just saw this recently with uh, two um, um, uh, accused persons who were in prison for a long time for the murder of Malcolm X. So lawyers are really working on those matters. Uh, I think it's important to realize we need to work on other matters as well when we're in a crisis as we are with climate change. And that the fact that we do well in one area doesn't mean that that lets us off the hook in other areas. So the question on law reform is, can lawyers do this? And the answer is yes. The model rules make it clear, although <clears throat> there is some balancing of looking at your client's interest and if your pursuit could um, uh, hurt the client, you need to get consent or not have that client. But law reform, we would really be in a sorry mess today if lawyers had not reformed environmental law. Uh, since the 1970s, we have had substantial law reform. And in fact, all of environmental law basically is a qualification, um, a limitation of the idea that um, whatever you can make, the free market principle, whatever you can make, however uh, it might endanger someone else, is your right uh, in business. So the edifice really of Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, CERCLA, TSCA, Endangered Species Act, National Environmental Policy Act, all of those have come from lawyers and citizens seeking to have those changes made. So the next question is, well, can lawyers reform the model rules? Yes, absolutely. That's, we are the public citizens with responsibility for the quality of justice. I'll give you a very brief example of this. Uh, some very prominent news stories over the years have shown uh, persons wrongfully incarcerated for uh, crimes they did not commit and lawyers who have had to remain silent because the rule on confidentiality prohibited them from revealing the information that would exculpate those people who are in prison. Now, one state, and I believe it's Massachusetts, I wanted to check that, but I think that's right, has now included in the exceptions that allow a lawyer to speak um, under confidentiality have included uh, wrongful incarceration of someone. So, you know, we have under 1.6, the exceptions to um, prevent uh, death or substantial bodily injury to comply with law, uh, and then uh, financial interests are also protected there. But one state has this new provision that says to prevent someone from being wrongfully incarcerated. The idea of these model rules is that the 50 experiments, 50 states would have different provisions. And then we would all sort of confer about the progress made by different states and decide whether or not uh, your state wants to uh, make a change. So yes, part of the lawyer's duty as public citizen is reforming the model rules. Really everything that touches on the public interest. I'll have one that uh, might seem uh, trivial, but that is I would like to get rid of the blue book or limit it very substantially. Why is that? I think it's a bar to access to justice. All of that checking of commas and italics has to be done by someone. Maybe it's not the lawyer, but a paralegal costs money also. And so it is one partial barrier to people being able 
to present their case. Um, so I want to tell you about the first petition uh, that has been filed under FTC new rules that try to um, regulate more fully the uh, false statements in the marketplace. And the claim here is that Chevron overstated its investment in renewable energy and its actions to curb greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we are seeing uh, the FTC and other regulatory entities stating new green guidelines. And um, so this does create a new possibility for lawyers to bring actions uh, against the kind of conduct that might put us all at risk. And of course, the common law itself changes all the time in relation to new threats that we identify. John Kerry told us recently that we're all climate lawyers now. This was a speech to the American Bar Association. And uh, he, of course, is the special presidential envoy for climate. And he warned that we are on a path to catastrophe and that we need to accept and respond to the challenge of our time. So I'm another one on this. And the examples he gave were not things you would think of, of environmental law, bankruptcy, uh, transaction work, financing, construction, land use and procurement, of course, drafting and administration, enforcement and negotiation. He sees, and I get his point, that all of these can impact the climate. Uh, in 2019, the American Bar Association House of Delegates did a res resolution, not their first, uh, which urged lawyers to engage in pro bono activities to aid efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change, and also to advise their clients of the risks and opportunities that change, climate change provides. And this is what I was talking about earlier when I said, well, there are non-apparent risks out there. That's the example I gave of CERCLA. Uh, and there are non-apparent benefits as well. Uh, just think of all the jobs that have been created for uh, biologists to do biological opinions on endangered species, for solar roofing, for green, creating green guidelines, for creating jobs that serve uh, any sort of cleanup mitigation uh, strategies. It is a major part, that's my soft alarm, not quite as soft as I wanted, uh, it is a major segment uh, of our economy today. So when we talk about losing jobs to environmental regulation, we need to count them up because uh, if there's a job lost, uh, for mining, uh, those um, actually, and many of those jobs now have been lost already to mechanization. Uh, jobs for installing solar panels, that's the easiest and frequent example. But as I've suggested just now, there are so many jobs available for um, environmental stability and improvement of the environment. Uh, the International Bar Association has urged lawyers along those similar lines. I want to go back here to the prior slide just to note, John Dernbach was one of the principal drafters of this um, uh, resolution by the ABA. So uh, I want to tie this very briefly to an article that I did uh, 26 years ago, I think, in honor of the judge I clerked for. And the, in that article, I drew out similar time, types of, of touchstones. And in this, in this book chapter, I looked at those. Uh, first, do no harm. It's a little too mushy, so uh, just too unclear. I said, make things better. Of course, we all do want to do that. And I think the idea of lawyering itself springs from the idea of an ordered society 
let's don't resolve our disputes by violence. Let's use the rule of law and lawyers are integral to doing that. The final thing was do not become your job. Uh, keep some balance in your life. That sounds fun. And I think it's also good for you because if you become a robot or just someone under so much stress, you really can't do a good job. So I was 15 years into my law practice when I wrote that. And the, the revelation that I have had from this is that our ABA rules ask us to do more. They don't ask us just don't do no harm. They say, make it better. They say, work for the improvement of the law at every level, really. So I like the point that obviousness sometimes contains profound statements. I, I like this one by T.S. Eliot. Um, in our search, he says, we will search, we will not tire, we will do our best. And then we arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And I think that's uh, part of why I want to look at these matters of touchstones. First, obey the law. It's like, well, we know that already. Well, let's look at all these ways and we see that it is important. Uh, and then we uh, arrive where we have been and know more about it, know it for the first time, he says. So in my slides for you, I include uh, the full uh, part of this uh, well-known quote from uh, the quartets. And then I want to leave you just with um, this overarching point that the law gives us durable principles, but they do have to change in regard to circumstances on the ground. Uh, for example, riparian rights in the East wouldn't work in the West. And so we have prior appropriation as a system. And now that system is going to be challenged as well because of water scarcity, and we will have to adapt our system in order to survive and meet the needs of people. So the overarching point, I think, is that the principles of the law are here to serve the public interest. Think about it. If um, someone challenges that and says, well, I don't think always, think, well, what law is there not to serve the public? And if there is one, why would we allow it to exist? Uh, and then just recognition that circumstances can change and further recognition that circumstances have changed. And we are in a climate disruption, which is a crisis. And that's, that's the end of my slides. So I am uh, very uh, eager to hear questions and talk with you. Well, thank you very much, Irma. That was that was quite wonderful. Um, it might be easier um, if you took down the share screen for us all yeah. to see each other. Yes, I agree. Okay. So we can do this two ways. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, um, but if you have a question and you want to simply raise your hand electronically, um, I'll take your question electronically. I should say while I'm waiting for a question to come up that the, the, um, the point of the book was to provide an on-ramp for lawyers who are interested in doing work on sustainable development and climate change and give them a handle on how they could proceed. And uh, Irma's chapter was intended to, to look at the rules of professional responsibility, which some people see as a hindrance uh, and some people see uh, uh, as, as sort of an encouragement to go out and do whatever you think you need to do. And so 
our thought was is that the guidance that Irma provides at least begins to frame how lawyers can proceed. Um, there's a Barb Vallaw, uh, you have your hand up. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can't see you, but I can hear you. Okay, so here's my question. You say that why, if, if, if a law does not benefit the public, why would a lawyer have it be around? And the answer is very simple. In a law firm, there's one metric that matters, net profit per partner in the next quarter. And if it benefits people who can increase net profit per partner in the next quarter, then the lawyer will, will be in favor of and argue for that law because that is how you buy the Mercedes in the next quarter or the BMW in the next quarter and you make partner and you go on to the executive committee and so forth. So, you know, why do you even, even say that? Is that a rhetorical question? Oh, no, uh, the question is different though. Uh, the question is not why would the lawyer have it around? Why would society who sets the laws and sets the norms allow it to exist? In other words, because uh, society is not equal because the powerful in society want that law and they have the money to pay lawyers and lobbyists and legislators to keep the law around. Yes. And I, yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. And I am uh, more and more concerned about the system as you um, describe it. I really am. And I think we are at a new level in that system. Uh, so it, it's not rhetorical, but it is sort of foundational. If, if we put that question to, not to lawyers, I mean, this is lawmakers that we're talking about. And um, corruption does exist and always has existed. So I'm really trying to reach down to the uh, the power of the people, really. And if you address it directly, does this law serve the public good? Every law you look up, you know, has a preamble uh, that says this is for a public purpose. Even copyright law, it's not for the, no law justifies itself on these corrupt ends. Um, we might say, well, copyright law, that's not for the public, that's for the individual. But coffee, copyright law justifies its existence by saying, we have this to protect the author or the poet or the um, whoever claims the copyright in order to create creativity for society. So the grounding of these laws uh, is in the public interest. And uh, I guess my, my statement is public recognize that this is the appropriate use of law. And when it's being corrupted, you know, we need to do something about it. But I agree with you, Barb, that there is um, money does affect norms for sure. Does that, does that distinction make any sense to you, Barb? Well, it does, except that I would remind you again of, I believe it was Henry Ford that said, it is very difficult to convince a man to believe something when his salary depends on his not believing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've worked at a law firm in Pittsburgh that used to represent coal companies. And all the miners who came in said, I don't want my son to follow me into the mines. Right. right. But you talk to the sons and they'll tell you coal miners were gods because they could make 18, 80 to $100,000 a year with only a high school education. And none of that is true, but they believe it. Yes. Because right. that's what they want to believe. Right. So my statement is to uncover the truth and share the truth and judge these laws by the truth and um, hoping the coal miners convert to jobs that will not kill them um, is a worthwhile undertaking as well. My dad was a railroader. He, he did have black lung, not from the coal mine, but from railroading and uh, retired early and sort of beat it. 
uh, against many different uh, diseases. He, he was able to, but he uh, had that job uh, because of the economic realities in his life, of course. So does, uh, do we have other questions? So we're waiting for a question, Irma. Let me let me ask one. Okay. Um, there's a number of younger lawyers and law students that are um, are on the Zoom today, and um, as they start out, um, what advice would you give them? Yeah. Um, there's so much advice to give, and some of it can be cynical. So if you're a general counsel, the time worn advice is keep your resume up to date and your bags packed because general counsel sometimes will be in the situation uh, of uh, either needing to join the fraud of the company or face discharge. But, you know, I think that there are signs that standing up can, and a, and a tipping point is coming. And we've had these various tipping points uh, in the past where, you know, the environmental laws of uh, the 70s and 80s became a bidding war of the Republicans and the Democrats of who would be the most protective of the environment. And of course it was President Nixon who signed uh, EPA's NEPA and created the EPA. So um, the idea that the growth of green economy can make a difference is a real idea, but it doesn't mean that it's here today or closes the minds. It is a work in progress, definitely. And I think some of the, some of the young lawyers who are coming up would profit by thinking through uh, the um, ways to become adept at helping your clients identify non-apparent benefits that can come to them through a green economy and maybe non-apparent risks that they may not be valuing, they may be underestimating that can land on them. So this is again, kind of back to uh, my experience in practice. And there has been a change because enforcement and you know every major criminal uh, uh, environmental statute has criminal provisions and people have done time. So the corporations who would have said to me, oh, you must be kidding, you know, little lady, uh, now are much more eager to comply because the, the cost of imprisonment is one that cannot be passed on to the consumer. So we do have, I think, uh, more compliance or at least more uh, lip service to compliance. I know that there are cases of uh, corporate officials that are hiding the truth or simply, as I talked about under 1.2D, making sure that uh, no one can follow the paper trail to them uh, that exists. And just having laws against murder doesn't mean people won't murder people, of course, but the laws have to be there in the public interest. And then the will to comply and the will to advise compliance has to be there as well. So I think a lot of these themes and a lot of the techniques of this are what we try to set forth in the book. And so, check it out from the library. I say that because I don't wanna be self-promotional here at all. Uh, and you know, there, in terms of um, publication, we see the back and forth of this all the time. More and more uh, publications are putting things between, behind paywalls and you have to pay. But also more and more writers are putting information out in open source information. A lot of law professors now are putting their materials out open source where anybody can get them. And so I guess there are always um, 
conflicting forces going forward, trying to either maximize individual preferences, individual profit, or trying to maximize uh, public good. So yeah, I will, Barb, I'll stick by the idea that the concept of lawyering is for the public good to prevent violent dispute resolution. I think that's kind of where it began, but it doesn't mean that um, bad things don't happen uh, to good people. I think we have time for about one more question. Anybody? Well, let me ask you a question. Has anyone in your representation of people been surprised, let's say pleasantly or unpleasantly, about the point of view of the client? I'll take anything I can get. I'm not seeing an answer yet, Irma, no. <laughs> but, um, but I did see a question in the chat. Oh, um, and the question reads as follows. You mentioned that riparian rights in the Western US will change. Can you share your thoughts on what you think some of the major changes will be? Uh, will it still resemble prior appropriation or will it be, will it be a whole new concept? You know, I'm, I would be, I'll be um, sort of um, puffing myself up and speaking. Uh, as an expert where I am not. I've done some work on this. And when I was in, when I uh, lived in Montana and worked there, I did a little bit on water rights in Montana, but I'll make a very general prediction. I believe that more regulation will have to come into play, uh, particularly in the West. Because, and, and Jeff, I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on this because without it, I think violent uh, disruption will occur. You know, we've had we've had more oil wars, but if we are so scarce of water, violence will follow. Jeff, I want to hear what your thoughts are. So uh, we'll either have more regulation, more special masters in the West, um, different allocation, or, or we will see. Um, some water wars, local or regional. Jeff, you're muted. If you're trying to talk, Jeff, we can't hear you. Maybe you're not able to unmute yourself. Yeah. And I don't know if I can unmute you. Let's see. Oh, I can ask you to unmute. I don't think I can unmute you. No, we're not. We're not getting Jeff. Yeah. Very good presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks. I learned some things. Oh, good. You can see my picture, and you know. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I'd love to uh, hear. Uh, have Very more knowledgeable. Dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're at we're just at about the end of the hour. Um, the the uh, I'll remind you that the 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 evaluation forms are um, uh, it, it's not the 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 um, the CLE form is 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 um, on the on the chat where a link to it is. Um, I want to thank Irma again for um, uh, not just the presentation today, but the thoughtful things she said, but actually uh, for the kind words she said about, about the work that we've been doing together. Um, it's been a privilege and an honor to be able to work with Irma um, on this project and over other projects over the past um, number of years. And I, I hope today that she's given you something to think about. Um, and. Uh, um, I wish you all well wherever you are and uh, whatever you do. Thank you all very much. Good to be with you.